أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين Verse number 223 Nisa'ukum harthul lakum fa'atu harthakum anna shi'tum wa qaddimu li'anfusikum wa attaqu Allah wa alamu annakum mulaquh wa bashiril mu'mineen Your women are a cultivation for you so approach your cultivation as you wish and send ahead for your souls and be God weary and know that you will encounter him and give, give good news to the faithful. This uh, is in a sense a continuation of the previous verse when it talked about yes, alunaka and al mahir they ask you about uh, menstruation and say that it's hurtful. Uh, this is one of the most fascinating verses of the Quran about treatment of women in a society where uh, the treatment was very harsh, um, very uh, derogatory, uh, with, with contempt and things like that. Now here, uh, there are several uh, sentences which tells us how Allah is considering the way women were treated by men, especially in a society where they were really, um, usually they were uh, uh, subject to uh, contempt and, uh, and violence and things like that. Now, Nisa'akum harthun lakum. In Majma al-Bayan, Sheikh Tabrasi says, it means, zawatu harthun lakum. They are the ones who cultivate for you your children. They are the ones who uh, you enjoy their company. That's what he says. Harthun lakum min hunna tahruthuna walad waladha. You enjoy their company. You get your children from them. Now, fa'atu harthakum anna shi'atum. Approach your cultivation as you wish. It's very interesting. Again, he says, your cultivation. Be careful that the way Allah has created them for you and you for them because of course the question was about menstruation and then the issue of women so that's why it's addressed to men and your wives are like that otherwise both spouses are uh, blessings of Allah for each other however here fa'atu harzakum anna shi'tum anna in Arabic has three meanings and the the, the commentators, based on their cultural background, has given it different meanings. Anna means wherever, whenever, or in whatever way. All three, all three mata, aina, kaifa. All three meanings are possible for Anna. So some have said Anna shaitum, wherever you want, or whenever you want. But uh, the best translation, which actually uh, uh, goes very well in the, to, in the context of the verse. If we say wherever or whenever, we have brought it out of its context, as we will see later on the, 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 the line of sentences which follow. So the best uh, translation for Anna here means in whatever way. It's a sort of threat to men that be careful, your wives are your cultivations that Allah has created for you, from whom you get your children, from whom you get love, you enjoy their company, all these things. So treat them in whichever way you wish. I am watching. It's just like the other verse that we have, uh, which says that, فَأَمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ إِنِّي بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ do whatever you want to do in this world. I am watching over you. It doesn't mean that Allah has given you liberty to do whatever you want to do. No. I am watching. Be careful. You can, of course, 
uh, lead your life in whichever way you like, but there will be a destination, there will be accounting. Here the same thing applies. So approach your cultivation as you wish. Means that I am watching, be careful. And the following sentences actually is very uh, telling about why Anna here should be taken as kaifa in whichever way, rather than uh, mata and aina, when and where. So, fa'atu harthakum anna shi'atum wa qaddimu anfusikum. Here, qaddimu anfusikum and send forward for yourselves, for your own souls. If we say, fa'atu harthakum anna shi'atum, wherever, whenever, qaddimu anfusakum here, and then fattakullah, and then wa'alamu annakum mulaqu, be careful, you are going to meet your Lord, wouldn't find much relation to this previous sentence. But if we say yes, in whichever way you want, and of course send forward for yourself good conduct, good behavior, goodly, a relationship with your with your wives. Some people have, uh, some commentators have actually interpreted this as children. Send forward children for yourselves, because nesaukum harthun lakum is a of their cultivation. So uh, treat them nicely and send forward children for yourself. But usually we don't send forward children for ourselves. It's a very rare sort of expression. Although some exes have said that this may refer to children who die at young age. Uh, let me just uh, mention a couple of uh, hadith in this respect. In Majmu al-Bayan, he says that, okay, قَدَّمُوا anfusakum means al-waladu salih yakunu taqdeeman azeeman. If you send forward, if you have children, it's just a, like a sort of good act that you send forward because we have in hadith, إِذَا مَا تَبْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَتَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا عَنْ ثَلَاثٍ When the son of Adam dies, their actions would cease except in three things. It's a very famous hadith, all of us know it. Waladun salihun yad ula, a good child that would pray and do istighfar for him. Wasadagatun jariya, and a continuous sadaqa like awqaf and uh, good acts which remain, the effect of which remain later on. Wa ilmun yuntafa'u bihi ba'da mawtih. And uh, knowledge that he leaves as books, things like that, that people would use and benefit from afterwards. Uh, therefore, qaddamu anfusukum here refers to this waladun salih. But not all children are salih, isn't it? So qaddamu anfusukum here cannot be a comprehensive term for uh, uh, this type of uh, amal which doesn't cease after one's uh, one's death. And also, is before you come, you send for yourself. But this is after we go. So it cannot be al The other meaning which they have given uh, based on another hadith is that uh, the children who die at young age, because of the uh, hadith of the Prophet, man qaddama thalathatun min al-walad, من قدم ثلاثة من الولد لم يبلغ الحنس لم تمسه النار Whoever sends forward three children who die at young age without age of maturity then fire would not touch them. It means because of the grief and grievances that have touched them in this world Allah would not allow grievances to touch them in the next world. As I said before, Allah compensates for whatever uh, grievances we suffer in this world, the believers. As I said, the, this, these believers have a different uh, sort of matter, different treatment, but for believers, any grievances they suffer in this world, Allah will compensate it in the next world based on his justice and kindness. So if someone sends forward three children, who die at young age, that grief would not allow fire 
to touch them. Faqila ya Rasulullah wasnan, qala wasnan. And they said, ya Rasulullah, what if two children of a person die at young age? He said, even two children would have that effect. Now, uh, to actually interpret waqaddimul anfusakum in this way, which are very limited cases. I mean, not everyone loses children at young age when they are young. Not everyone, of course, may have waladu saleh. So uh, probably it's not a good interpretation of qaddimul uh, anfusakum, sent forward. The best interpretation is that your good conduct with within the family, with your wives, is one of the most important amal salah good acts that you can send forward for yourself. And we have this in many other narrations. I wonder why uh, the commentators haven't taken those narrations which talk about good treatment, uh, in good conduct in family, has such a great effect in one's prosperity in the other life. And I've taken these very rare sort of narrations which do, does not, do, do not fit very much into the context of the verse. So, there are three, sent, four actually sentences which follow the way we treat women. One is sent forward for yourself. It means good treatment is a, an amal and salah that you send for yourself. What fear God. Usually, if you somehow uh, search into the verses which talk about the relationship between men and women, especially when it's addressed to men, it's always followed by what taqullah, fear God. Because, of course, women were very vulnerable at that time, and they, they, they were taken to be weak in society. So always this caveat of what taqullah, whenever, even if it's talaq, if it's whatever other sort of relationship with women, is always followed by what taqullah, fear God. And this very sort of uh, uh, magnificent sentence at the end, which rarely comes in the verse of the Quran, wa'alamu annakum mulaqu, know that you are going to meet him, and you have to prepare an answer for him when if you have if you doesn't don't have a good conduct and the fourth one is that if you have a good conduct give good news to the believers so these four sentences which come after nisa'ukum harthun lakum and these are your women are cultivation for you treat them in a way that you know allah is watching and then fear and send forward for yourself, fear God, know that you are going to meet Him, and good news for those who have that nice treatment with their wives, with women generally. Uh, with regards to wa'alamu annakum mulaqu, this is a, another very, of course, uh, uh, frightening threat if someone doesn't have that good conduct. Uh, after saying, uh, Okay, in whichever way you want to treat your women, because I'm watching, then the, 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 the sentence is a very sort of uh, uh, great threat for those who do not follow and abide themselves by, the, by, by this uh, uh, sort of uh, instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, وَأَلَمُ أَنَّكُمْ مُلَاقُوا Know that you are going to meet him. It means that, okay, you have to prepare answer for whatever you have done. And in that meeting, Allah will question you about your life, your conduct, everything that you have been doing uh, during your life. The only uh, question here that uh, Majma al-Bayan also has raised is that... Uh, What's the meaning of this mulaqat, the meeting? And mainly the exegetes have said that uh, uh, this mulaqat means 
you will meet his reward and punishment because it is impossible to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is not physical, Allah is everywhere, he's here now as he will be in the day of judgment. So uh, there's no meaning for, for this mulaqat although uh, some people have said that no, on the day of judgment, uh, especially al-mushabbiha, uh, uh, some Sunni groups have said that on the day of judgment people would meet Allah and will see him, the believers will see him with their eyes even, they will see him with their eyes. Here, uh, Sheikh Taprasi uh, mentions something uh, based on the, of course, Shia faith, Shia belief. He says that, uh, of course, it's not possible to say this meeting of Allah means we will see him. Meeting may have different meanings. For example, we say he met the reward of his actions or he met death. Now, when we say met death, it doesn't mean that, for example, saw death with, with eyes. It is an experience. Uh, because if, uh, if we want to say... Uh, if we want to say, for example, people meet Allah in the sense of vision, uh, we, ne we need to actually uh, consider physical uh, b physical aspects for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not possible. And also the other thing which the verse says is uh, everyone will meet Allah. And لَأَنَّ فِي الْآيَةِ إِثْبَاتُ اللِّقَاءِ لِلْجَمِيءِ الْعِبَادِ Everyone would meet. It's not only believers. Now, Mushabbiha, that group of Sunnis who say that we will see Allah on the Day of Judgment, say only the believers will see him. But the, and they actually bring this verse as a proof that you will see him, you will meet him, actually, not see, this doesn't say see, you will meet him. And they say the mu'minun, the believers, will see uh, by their eyes Allah on the day of judgment. But this is not about believers, it's everyone. Everyone will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, to to regard this meeting as meeting the thawab of Allah or the aqab of Allah, reward and punishment, is uh, uh, some, somehow depleting the verse, divesting the, the sentence from its flavor. Of course, all of us will meet the liqa, the, the thawab or iqab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in many cases, we have you will meet him. And some people have said you will meet him means you die because by death we will meet the consequences of our, our actions. There is a point, Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadhun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqih. You are laboring a journey towards your Lord and you will meet him. It means there's a journey which leads us to a position where we come to an experience of God, which is as meeting him. And that experience is very different from the experience that, for example, people have in this world, including prophets, awliya, all. This experience is very different from the experience which happens on the day of judgment for everyone. And that is the, the people would grow, the capacities would expand to a point where an experience of God will become possible for mu'min and kafir. No, no difference. An experience of God will become possible that is like meeting the Lord. Now, inshallah, when we go there, we will realize what that means, what that meeting means. But to take it as meeting the liqa and the, the, the thawab and iqab is actually taking the flavor of this uh, uh, sentence and this sort of experience while we can have a good, of course, interpretation for meeting with, with Allah. Those who have said uh, it means thawab and iqab, reward and punishment, have tried to deny visual encounter with Allah. The meeting which we have in this world, but it not necessarily mean that. It should not necessarily mean that. It's just a sort of experience of Allah, which is not possible while, like for example, we didn't have 
any experience of Allah whatsoever when we were in the wombs of our mothers. No experience at all. When we have come to this world, of course, we have met Allah in a sense, isn't it? We have met Allah in the sense that we know him, we know about him. There are some sort of uh, personal experiences, heartfelt experiences that we have. It is a sort of encounter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that final encounter that we will have, that final experience is laqa Allah, of course. So the, the verse which says, it's very uh, unsavory to say that you are laboring towards the thawab and iqab of Allah and you will meet that. It takes the flavor from the verse. Anyhow, verse number 224 turns into another uh, sort of uh, uh, relationship between men and women. And an, as an introduction... It uh, gives something about uh, the way we take our oaths. There was uh, one sort of oath that people in Jahiliyyah used to take called ilah. And ilah meant that they swear that never they approached their wives anymore. And then their wives became suspended not, as not married and married. So they just left them like that. This was called ilah. And this was a qasam that they made, and it was not possible to break it. There was no talaq here, there was no divorce, and women would just uh, uh, remain loosely connected to this man, and this man, of course, never uh, approached them anymore. Now, the verse turns here now to another very bad treatment of women. As I said, all this about treatment of women, However, because that was an oath that they made to actually uh, uh, not approaching their woman, first it says, okay, we have two types of oaths. One type of oaths which are uh, useless oaths that you take, and the other oaths which are, of course, oaths uh, that should be, uh, should be respected. Uh, the types of oath are mentioned first, and then it goes to the question of ilah. So it's very much connected to the previous verses when it talks about treatment of women. Do not make Allah an obstacle through your oaths to being pious and god weary and to bringing about concord between people. And Allah is all hearing, all knowing. So, Ayman is the role of Yameen. Yameen literally means right hand, of course. And because usually when people made uh, transactions with each other or wanted to make an, a firm oath, they shaked hand with, uh, with right hand. It's, of course, in every culture. It was called Yameen, the same thing as uh, right hand. So, Ayman, the prayer of Yameen, do not uh, put uh, Allah, make Allah an obstacle. I swear that I'm not going to talk to him or to her anymore. Now, what if talking is good, is advisable? What if such a conduct is nice and based on justice and you have made a pledge, you have made a an oath that you are not going to do it, uh, in a sense we have put Allah as an obstacle between us and good deeds, isn't it? An obstacle between us and good deeds. Uh, about Sha'an al-Nuzul of this verse, which uh, of course would not restrict the meaning, they say that Abdullah ibn Rawaha had some problem with his son-in-law or brother-in-law, mainly brother-in-law probably, Khatan has both meanings. He had a problem with his brother-in-law. We take it as brother-in-law. And, uh, and the brother-in-law had some problem with his wife, who was his sister, Abdullah ibn Rawah's sister. But he had made a, an oath uh, that halafa Allah yadkhula ala khatanihi, that he would never meet his brother-in-law never talk to him, and never uh, mediate between him and his, his wife, the wife of uh, 
his uh, brother-in-law, who was his own sister, never mediate between them. Probably something what happened, he had said something or he had tried to mediate and they rejected or something like that. He made an oath that he would not do it anymore. And then, of course, the verse is, in a sense, condemning him for that. That's why you make an oath to, to refrain from a good act. And if you do that, in a sense, you have made Allah an obstacle between you and good act, and this is a larv, this is a void oath. I, I do not accept this oath, and you have to break it. You have to break this oath. And as we have uh, uh, later on, I will mention that there are some, of course, faqhi implications for this, this type of oath. If you make an oath that you do not do something good, uh, then that oath should be broken. This is one meaning of it. That's, do not make Allah an obstacle. The other meaning is that do not make Allah a target, or the mean target as well, of your oaths. Meaning that all the time, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, you say, uh, yes, uh, I swear by God, no, I swear by God, bala wallah, la wallah, is a, a sort of... Uh, bad habit that you have, making Allah target of your oaths. And in this uh, uh, sort of meaning, there are some narrations that actually swearing an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always reprehensible, always. Whether you are right or wrong, whether you are telling the truth or, or not, uh, is always reprehensible, but if, for example, you are telling the truth, there is no punishment for it, and there is no kafara for it. If you lie, if you try, for example, to take right of others by oath uh, in which Allah is mentioned, then, of course, there is great punishment for that. Here we have some narrations from our A'imma alayhi salam in the second meaning. Of course, both meanings have been accepted by, by A'imma alayhi salam but in the second meaning they have mentioned a couple of, uh, we have a couple of narrations mentioned in our books. Like, for example, what is mentioned, what is reported from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam, who said, لا تحلف بالله صادقين ولا كاذبين. Do not swear by Allah, whether you are truthful or you are telling a lie. فإنه سبحانه يقول ولا تجعل الله أرضة لا يمنكم. Because he said, do not make Allah an a target. Actually, target is an obstacle as well, isn't it? When, uh, for example, an arrow is shot towards a target, that target stops the arrow from moving further. So, orza, uh, in, in the sense of target and in the sense of obstacle, have the same meaning, actually. And in uh, one rewaya, we have man halafa billah kadiban kafar. Whoever swears by Allah, while he is lying, is it, has committed kufr, kafara. Not kufr in the sense that has gone out of Islam, in the sense that his act, his act is tantamount to kufr. Man halafa billah kathiban kafar, wa man halafa billah sadiqan athim. And if someone swears by Allah, while he is truthful, has committed an ethm, a sin. It's, of course, Highly, highly reprehensible to do it. Eth in this sense, it means that. And then he said, "Wala taj alullah urdatan laaymanikum." In Majmul Bayan, Sheikh Tabrasi says that uh, this verse, this verse, indicates that whoever swears an oath by Allah, and then see that. This oath is preventing him or her from something good. Just like we said, for example, I make an oath that I never talk to my sister anymore, to my brother anymore, okay? If this oath is preventing, is, uh, is, is creating an obstacle between them and a good, that, a good deed, then that oath should be broken, must be broken. It's not the case that is at leave, whether he breaks it or not, must be broken. Uh, and is there a kafara for breaking it or not? 
Now the fuqaha are actually differ here. Uh, the most, the majority of uh, uh, Sunni fuqaha say yes, there is a kafara. Now Sheikh Tabrasi says that la kafara alayhi indana. In our madhab, there is no kafara for it because it's a wajib. They have to do it. They have to break that oath. So, la taj'alullah urdatan la'aymanikum. Do not make an, uh, Allah an obstacle to, through your oath so that you be part, you do, you, you, for tabarru means to do good things. Here it's translated as to being pious. Well, being pious means to, good, to do good acts. Bar tabarru from bar means you make an oath like what we had in the example of uh, the ifk when people of Medina slandered against the wife of the prophet and alleged that she had committed adultery. Then after, of course, the verses were revealed, or even before that, some people swear by Allah that we are not going to help these people anymore because many of them were very poor. People of, in, many of them were muhajirun who were very poor. They spread the rumor. They spread the rumor and it actually affected the heart of the believers very much. So some of them swear by Allah that we are not going to help these people anymore, these people who do not have any regard for the prophets, who do not care what they say about the prophet. Then Allah uh, uh, actually uh, condemned them or advised them, break your oaths. You should not stop helping these people. Uh, that type of oath should be broken. I was thinking about the exact verse in Surah An-Nur. Uh, uh, Those of you who have wealth and, uh, and amenities should not swear that we do not help these people anymore. So this oath, that was a bear the oath was an obstacle between them and that bear. Ordatan la imanikum an tabarru wa tattaqu and fear God in whatever you do. Wa tusluhu bayna nas and of course bring concord between people, uh, make peace between them. Wallahu sami'un alim. And then of course it goes uh, into the uh, different types of oath and goes into ila which Allah we will discuss it later on wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa ali tahirin thank you very much sheikh um, so we now open the floor for further discussion for about 15 20 minutes uh, brothers and sisters anybody would like to um, continue or any point Thank you very much indeed for the lecture. Sheikh, not a question, but just a request. Um, the esoteric and deeper meaning of the Quran is obviously very fascinating and difficult. People like myself who have limited imagination and just see the printed word. But you very kindly, when we were doing Surah Araf, took some time out um, and set two or three lectures just talking about the Arsh, so we had a better understanding of that. I think the request to you is perhaps we can do the same thing about Lika Allah. Because that in itself is, again, very fascinating. There are very many um, examples of this in the Quran and also in, uh, in the Hadith. We look at Najul Balagha when Imam Ali alayhi salam was asked uh, if he had ever seen God and we know about his response. We also know about, for example, meetings which are described in the Quran like um, Musa meeting God. So there are very many aspects and we have all of these as well. Uh, you know, uh, so if if it's at all possible, it'd be very helpful. Inshallah, thank you, thank you for this. Yes. Thank you. Any sisters or any brother, anybody? Any brother or any sister? I don't have it. Right. <laughs> it's Christmas, so people want to. Any <laughs> concern? Um. You explained very well in, in terms of the idea of the, that the Qur'an is warning men 
in terms of how to treat their wives <coughs> and the four points that you made that um, God is watching you, you will meet your Lord and uh, send good deeds for you. And yet we see that even after the Prophet, until very recently, um, men did not treat their wives very well. And even some of the interpretations until recently, that... Until women now are mistreating <laughs> <laughs> I leave that for another time, but <laughs> okay. it, it it appears that even the uh, scholars have not uh, interpreted in the way that you presented it today. Could it be that partly we are seeing or we are interpreting the Quran now because of the change in the environment that we have, and in the environment that they used to to live in, they didn't actually quite see it the way perhaps you are presenting it. Uh, yes, I was actually pondering on the way, especially in this verse, Nisa'ukum harthun lakum, fa'atu harthakum anna shaytum, the way different Sunni and Shia interpreters had actually interpreted it. And uh, uh, first of all, it was a bit out of context. And mostly they referred to early Tabi'in interpreters like Qatada and Zahak and Mujahid and others who lived in a type of society. Uh, certainly, I mean, uh, the cultural background of people would have a great influence of the way they understand this. As long as we do not deviate from the literal meaning, as long as we are not imposing a meaning on the Quran which we cannot accept, I think it's fine if we, uh, if we understand in different ways. Uh, when I was actually reading this, I was reminded of the verse which uh, Allah, when he gave Torah to Musa, he said, uh, Command your people take the best of it. Now, of course, all of it are or best. You, we cannot say, for example, choose and pick verses which are better. No. It means the best interpretation, the best action and the best interpretation. And we hope always we have to ha take the best interpretation, which is based more on justice, most, more on fairness. So uh, uh, it is true that uh, in, in a very different sort of uh, culture, people understood different things. As I said, Anna has three meanings, isn't it? It's wherever, whenever, and in whichever way you want. Depends how our attitude is that to take which meaning of Anna, and that's very important. Yeah. Thank you, Sheikh. Any sisters? Any brother? Anybody? No? No? Yeah. So far. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Inshallah after Thank Christmas. Muhammad Wali Muhammad. Thank you, Muhammad.